It's always special to talk about a Rolex that's not a sports watch, that's not in stainless steel and is frankly not desirable. Yes, we are talking about the Rolex 1908. What was that? No, this watch does exist. The Cellini was discontinued and, and this watch now is, is a part of the collection. Did you, did you forget, like I did, like most of us did? And the fact that this watch hasn't had much marketing or advertising or promotional material around it? Yep. So is this a watch that has longevity or is it a glorified stocking filler in order to climb the retailer rankings? Let's investigate the strange case of the Rolex 1908. I like the, the alliteration there. It is terrible to think that today, in some cases, we view watches not as individual items to buy and enjoy, but rather as stepping stones that will pave the way to the pieces that we are ultimately pursuing. The whole stigma of watches becoming commodities and not necessarily valuable to the owner is an odd one. What's interesting is that the Cellini collection, as a modern property, it hasn't been popular. I think for the simple reason that most don't instantly imagine Rolex as a dress watchmaker. Even though Rolex does have a history steeped in the development of grand complications for their watches, even as far back as the 1950s. But nowadays they are viewed more for their sporty utility appeal. And the even greater irony is that Rolex does have that potential to rival the manufacturers like Gégé Lecoutre and Vacheron. With the watchmaking prowess that they now possess, the amount of work and effort they put into their calibers, and the many accomplishments that they have in the past, and if they really wanted to, they could produce world-leading dress watches. But as we know, perception is everything. The image of the brand is so closely associated with the products they produce, and while well, the Oyster Perpetual is the modern icon. The evolution of this name is frankly incredible. No matter where you stand with Rolex as a manufacturer, seeing how all of these names have blossomed over the decades, all originating from that basic starting point of an integral water-resistant case. And then that leads neatly on to the first question, why does Rolex still make dress watches? I think beyond all else, it's Rolex proving that they can, that they can still make an elegant piece that's not a sports watch. And sure, they aren't very popular. I doubt the 1908 will ever reach the same heights as their most important sports pieces. But these original designs were made before the steel bracelet became popular, before the sports watch even was a thing. But more importantly, it shows their potential. It shows their ability to do something else and also offers a greater point of difference to their customer base. Maybe those who are tired of wearing the Oyster or the Jubilee bracelet and want something in leather, who wants that assurance and reliability of a great movement as well as a better water resistance rating than most other dress watches today. But why does the 1908 exist? Why did this watch replace the Shalini collection, which had a far more outstanding collection with meteorite dials, moon phases, date complications. I see this new collection, and yes, we're going to talk about the design and a few ideas that I have later on, but this to me feels like them testing the waters. This is the baseline starting point. They have eliminated all the superfluous and started right from scratch. At the same time, with the inclusion of all these new features, this is also a competitive move. This is them upscaling their dress watches to compete with the likes of Patek Philippe, Vacheron Constantin, Audemars Piguet, Gégé Le Coutre, and many others. This can be clearly indicated by the pricing structure and how these watches now situate themselves in the hierarchy of things. But we shouldn't forget that the brands that this watch is now competing with, well, they have been dress watch manufacturers for a very long time and they have never stopped. And instead of trying to focus on re-establishing their designs from the outside, these makers like Alango and Zona are a lot further ahead. They're focusing on the inside. Instead of pioneering these flush and beautiful cases that are water resistant, these makers are looking at triple split chronographs, full perpetual calendars, with integrated automatic winding systems, with integrated tourbillons, rattrapants, fuse and chains, a greater emphasis on hand finishing and hand engraving, a far more artisanal approach when it comes to grand faux enamel dials and cloisonne, piece uniques that are bringing back 100 year old observatory rated calibers. So I hope you get what I mean. Yes, this is a great starting point, but Rolex's competition is very, very far ahead in this realm. And in order for this 1908 to debut and to make a huge dent and to really turn heads, it needs to arrive with something outlandishly great. 
It needs to approach the dress watch in an entirely unique way that is also quintessentially Rolex. So now that we've established that this watch is trying something different, it's branching out, and it's also attempting to compete with names that are far more established and have a better understanding of the dress watch and its, its modern developments, these brands are trying to imbue their dress watches with vintage and modern DNA for today and for the future. The third reason for why this watch exists is the waiting list. The majority of Rolex buyers want watches in steel. They want them to be sports watches. They want a GMT, a Submariner, a Daytona. They're not interested in the dress watch. The Cellini line was never popular, so to wipe the slate clean and to give a far simpler watch that has a few elements belonging to the likes of original Oyster Perpetuals, it makes it a lot more appealing. But ultimately, while Rolex is out of stock of everything, including date justs, this is a valid alternative. Someone can buy a watch like the 1908 and put their name down on a list for a steel watch or for a solid gold watch that they actually desire. So we can't for a second believe that there isn't an ulterior motive behind this watch and its sudden existence. This is a great place for a new customer to have a spending experience and to further invest their interest in the brand. With all of that and the conspiracy theories out of the way, let's focus on its design. Now, first impression says it's quite an odd looking watch. Yes, you can see it's a Rolex from the get go. And I think this was the first intention. It is a near faithful callback to a 1930s, I think 1931 Oyster Perpetual, one of the first Oyster Perpetual watches housed in a cushion case. And I think to have this as a baseline is a very good start. This should have been emphasized more in the watch's advertising. We should have seen this next to the original and how these two watches work off one another. Now, of course, there have been many modern improvements from the case design to the arrangement of the numerals on the dial. But the hour hand, the elongated batons and the subdial seconds at the six o'clock, they're all closely affiliated to that first Oyster Perpetual. The question is, do all of these elements work well in tandem? Does this make a harmonious design? And I don't think it does. It is a very busy dial with a lot of applied elements, and it doesn't help the fact that with such a flat matte dial, which I also thought was a bit of an issue, they could have gone with gloss to make it a bit more exciting. These polished elements disappear under certain lights. And another ironic point is that with all of Rolex's modern sports watches, maybe save the Daytona, they, they all have one underlying word that defines them all, and that is legibility. In favor of its dress watch nature, this piece does sacrifice that legibility. So in thinking about how this watch could have done it better, I think restraint is the most important feature, especially when you're talking about such a beautiful dress watch. We look at the 5196 Calatrava. There's a reason why this watch has lasted almost 100 years. We look at the Breguet Classique, an insanely simple watch, but one that emphasizes handwork and machine finishing on those dials to create this level of three-dimensionality and appeal. So my interpretation of this original Oyster Perpetual would have been far simpler, and I'm not saying it's, it's as good or anywhere near as good, but this was the quick idea that I came up with. We eliminate the small seconds and instead opt for a central seconds hand with a counterbalance. This feels far more like what modern Rolex is about. And what I love the most is that that counterbalance paired with the hollowed out hour hand, they would look so seamless and elegant when their paths cross. And then instead of having those elongated batons crowding the dial at every five minute mark, making the dial feel a lot more claustrophobic, why not just go for applied hobnails fitted inside the railroad track? And then that ultimately lets the dial breathe a lot more, where the quarter arabics can be on display and act like a real feature to this dial. You can appreciate the open elements of the six and nine. And the fact that when you picture this watch entirely, it has a far more timeless aesthetic, not one that pertains to a specific time period, a specific century, but rather one that could have originated hundreds of years ago or could be as modern as a watch today but all the while celebrating all the most important attributes of the Oyster Perpetual. And I'd also say to liven up this matte dial, Grand Faux Enamel, gloss, black, and white. You know, the thing is with some of the most important dress watches in the world, they don't shout about their provenance. They don't even have it on display. They keep their designs minimal for a reason. So is the future of the 1908 destined for failure? That remains to be seen. This is definitely a great starting point, but in order for this watch to truly be a success, it needs to introduce complications. Look at the Daytona as a great source of inspiration. Why not make a beautiful dress chronograph? That would change the game. Start trying to implement more advanced calendar complications. And the most important thing that Rolex is most famous for is to hook people in with the narrative and the storytelling, and this one does have that origin. This has got to be one of their most traditionally inspired modern designs to date. 
in their catalogue. And this could very well be the start of something fresh and something new, but will this collection ever outperform the Rolex sports watch? Not in my lifetime. So this was a very perplexing release from the brand, and it's one that has a lot of conspiracy theories surrounding it. And I think the third point of it being a piece that is basically going to bring a new customer base into the brand, as well as putting people on the list for the watch that they truly desire. Unfortunately, with all the love and attention and artisanal quality that's gone into the cases and the finishing and the beautiful new movement, ultimately the 1908 can be seen as the stepping stone into the sports watches that are so desperately craved by many. But there is a lot of merit to this, and it's showing that Rolex is not giving up, that they're not being lazy and just focusing on what sells the best. They are interested in pushing the attention and focus elsewhere, but unless this watch really stands out from the crowd, this piece, like its predecessor, will also fade into obscurity. So what we can look forward to is seeing how this collection evolves and what the next step might be. But until then, thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video. And I'll see you in the next one.